to start with, it's, uh, we are going to do kind of a Q&A. I will time it just because I like to time things. <laughs> And I'll time it because, you know, it's like uh, knowing me, you know, we can stay the night here, you know, and I have some plans. <laughs> I wish. Uh, anyway, no, I, 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 you have to understand, I'm touring in America without a single um, institution supporting my act, uh, I managed to upset um, a lot of people. I'm really good at it. If you want to know how to learn how to upset people, you, and uh, I don't want to be supported by anyone. And it's quite frightening because uh, I come to LA and uh, we used to give these kind of talks in uh, the Levantine Center or a few other people and places and they are not there anymore. And it wasn't clear to me at all that you'll come here for me or for, for us and we would have a nice exchange that we're gonna have now. So I just want to, to thank you for your support. Really, really. I really appreciate it. Okay. Yeah. How does the story of the Holocaust play into this? <laughs> Did you hear the question? Yeah. Do you have the answer? Okay. It's quite easy to answer. The story of the Holocaust, as it stands, is the ultimate form of a Jerusalemite disaster. I say it again, the Holocaust narrative, as it stands, is a total Jerusalemite disaster. Why? It is not dominated by Athenian approach to reason, to historicity, to philosophy, to metaphysics. It is dominated by law. There are few things that you are entitled to say, and many, 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 many things that you are not allowed to say. My approach to history is Athenian, I hope. I argue that history is the attempt to narrate the past as we move along. Which means that as we move along and our perceptions of things is changing, our past may as well change accordingly. And I give you a great example. I guess that we have some Palestinian supporters in the room, I hope. Do we? Do I? Yeah. yeah. The Nakba. The Nakba is the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people in 48. This is quite a common term. Most people who look into politics are aware of this notion. I never heard about the Nakba about the, uh, until the 90s. Two days ago, I was sitting with a few Palestinians, and Munir, it will be interesting for me to hear what you, because you are a person who survived the Nakba to a sudden, you and your family. We were sitting, I was sitting with a few Palestinians, and there was a Palestinian there, 30. And then, when is the first time you heard about the Nakba? And he said, 15 years ago. When is the first time you heard about the Nakba, brother? Since you grew I, up with it. Since I was born. Yeah, he's from Gaza. But in the West, nobody spoke about the Nakba until the <laughs> late 80s, am I right? Probably. I'm right. You know why? 
You know why? The Nakba happened in 48. But it was the crisis, the war in Kosovo, that led some Israeli new historians, some of them are actually Palestinians, like Nur Masalha, to understand that the ethnic cleansing in Kosovo is a reflection of the ethnic cleansing that took place in Palestine in 48. But nobody spoke about it because until the 80s there was no such a notion of ethnic cleansing. It was the event in Kosovo that made ethnic cleansing into a popular notion and we then reinterpreted the events of 48 as an ethnic cleansing and this ethnic cleansing is called the Nakba. What I'm showing you here, that we evolve and suddenly we see the past differently. The same applies the, to the Holocaust. We use all those reels of this, you call them Muslim. Do you know what Muslim, Muslim were? They, they were the, 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 you know when the allies uh, entered the concentration camp because of the typhus, because of all the diseases, the situation was horrendous and the, the, the five oldest inmates, many of them Jews, in a devastating state, which interpreted at the time, and probably until now by most people, as a clear evidence of Nazi brutality, which is not necessarily, this is not the evidence of Nazi brutality. Germany was destroyed, and we can talk about it, but this is not the issue here. I don't want to get into details. In the, in the light of those horrific images, we would have a clear vision that was pro-Jewish, empathic to Jews in 46, 47, 48. Hang on a minute. In 48, the Jews, three years after the liberation of Auschwitz, doing exactly the same thing to the Palestinians. Is it the same people? Is it the people who were liberal? I don't know. I don't go there. And since then, we see constant abuse of Palestine. And now it's expanded to Syria. And suddenly we see the Jewish lobby, APAC, CRIF in France, CFI, somebody spoke about Australia, dominating our foreign policies, sending us into idiotic wars and people start to say you know what maybe we should look again at Jewish history why it happens to Jews all the time and it happens to Jews all the time how is it possible that Jews suffer time after time in so many different places Israel Zionism was born by Jewish anti-Semites, because they said, Ade Gordon, Herzl, Jabotinsky, they said, there is something fundamentally wrong about us, the Jews. We want to come to Palestine, to Zion, they call it, and we will bring to light a new Jew. We said, we make the Jew people, the Jews people like all, all other people. Yeah? Am kechola amin, they call it, for those who speak Hebrew. By the way, it's an idiotic statement because all other people don't want to be like other people. You Americans, you don't want to be like other people. Only the Jews want to be like other people, so it doesn't work. But, look what happened. They wanted to be people like other people, and they're not. It didn't work. History must be subject to revision, and now go back to the Holocaust. The Holocaust must be subject to revision. When history is not sub subject to revision, it becomes a religion. It stops being history. And this is exactly what happened to us with the Holocaust. Who to blame? Progressives. Because if you come and say, you know what, I, I look into the evidence and I don't think that 
the God's chairman, I, I don't know. You lose your job. A, you are entitled to be wrong. But there is a slight chance that you're actually right. And these questions must be discussed in the most tolerant manner. Today, I saw a horrific video, it's a new video, it came out today, of Deborah Lipstadt, the, the, the rabbi of uh, Holocaust denial, uh, you know, the, the Holocaust denier hunter, you know, on TED, on TED. And she was attacking uh, David Irving and so on and so on and so on. Will TED invite David Irving tomorrow <coughs> to present his argument? No. I don't think so. And you know why? Because TED is the ultimate form of Jerusalem in our midst. They spread all these beautiful, idiotic ideas as if there is any truthfulness in them. This is my take on the Holocaust. It's a religion, and if it's a religion, I want to be an atheist. Next. Were Zionists or Jews involved in 9-11? I wasn't in the airplane. <laughs> and I and I wasn't one of those Israelis who were dancing on the van <laughs> or the bridge or wherever. You look like one. I know, I know, I know. And this is why, and this is why, this is why it is so important for me to mention that I'm not this Moshe Chazemchoyes, no. It's not me. All right? I'm sorry. And this, the accent is even the same. <laughs> but the answer is exactly the same. This question must be discussed in the open. Now, I'm not a 9-11 <coughs> expert, as much as I'm not a gas chamber expert. I'm a saxophonist, you heard me. I'm playing, this is what you call a jazz saxophonist. This is what I'm doing. And I talk about Jewish identity politics. I'm the best, if to judge by uh, their show, it's uh, uh, attack on me. <coughs> My task is to make sure that we understand that we can ask those questions. And why? What is the Mossad's motto? Do you have, do you have uh, the, the Ostrovsky book? I saw it the other day. OK, it's gone. Um, by way, by way of, of deception. deception. Who were the first to celebrate? on the event, the Israelis, who have been, who are the people who were pushing us into every possible war against Islam, against Arabs, against the enemies of Israel, the Israelis. So the question is relevant. It's relevant, it's the most re relevant question. By the way, the fact that they did it doesn't yet provide the proof that they were involved. The way these things are, the way the Mossad is operating is slightly more sophisticated. They would use someone else that would do, that could to do things that may not, you know, that they may not uh, uh, be uh, you know, agents who may not be aware of their operators. I don't want to go into it. I just want to say yes. You are entitled to ask this question, and not just in Gilad Atzmon events, but everywhere. If this society cannot cope with this, with this question, and few other questions, we have a huge issue. This is not supposed to be a dog whistling question. It's supposed to be the most important question American society has to deal with. I don't want to take too much time, yeah. and, I, and I don't want to get into complications. But I think one thing about 9 11, if you look at New York from the air, yeah. uh, the World Trade Center is seven buildings, right? Yeah. 
every single building was destroyed, not just the two, every single building yeah. was destroyed beyond repair in different ways. No other building was touched around anywhere. Now, you think that Larry Silverstein owned that. That's uh, a deal. Listen, as, you can, as you can imagine, as you can imagine, I'm fully aware of all of it. I don't have any issue okay. with it. Okay. I, but, but this is not the topic, you know, if uh, the I next time that. I'll come and uh, do a, a, a tour on 9 you know. No problem. You know, I really thought that 9 I, I was so sure that you're talking about Porsche car. <laughs> you know, so it took me some time to understand. But what is really has to do with Zionist have to do with Porsche car? Anyway, you want, yeah. yeah. Well, you, you obviously knew I was a Jew and, uh, I yeah, I was born. Probably my nose, but uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, my father, most all my family, they're big time Zionists. So every time I speak about these things, it's like a pearl clutch, and you know they don't know what to do with me. So what do you think needs to be done? First, <laughs> about your parents, about your parents, <laughs> or just my family in general. Uh, that's a good question. Show me a picture of your mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously, yeah, yeah. I want, so if it's, if it's, uh, I may be able to do something. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. But, uh, but, um, no, I, I, I ask because it always, if you want to, to solve something in the Jewish family, you negotiate it with the mom. The father is, as you know, is a pretty useless uh, character. It's funny you say that. <laughs> <laughs> my, mom, my mom more so understands where I'm kind of coming from. You see? You but, see? But, Did, uh, I got it. But my father is just like... He's yeah, but the, fa the father is easy. You, you sort it out with the mom. Right. Hey, mommy, you know, you know. And then she will... She should, uh, you know, there is a story about, uh, about uh, a Jewish boy comes back from school saying, Mommy, mommy, I, I, I'm going to play in the, I, I, I got a, a, a role in the, in the, in the, in the play, you know, in two months. And the mother asked him, what are you going to, to be? The, the Jewish father, she said, you go back and you ask for a, a, for a, a speech role. <laughs> All right. So basically you have to negotiate it with mommy. And uh, no, now to be serious. It's not an easy situation because Jerusalemite, and I assume that they are Jerusalemite, the mother maybe slightly less, you know what is a Jewish mother? I have it in the funny book, in the black book. It's basically like a Jewish father but with balls. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how can you help nice. this guy? No, no, no. I'm trying. <laughs> now, when you talk to Jews, you have to employ humor. Okay. All right? <laughs> the issue is very problematic because it is pretty much impossible to liberate people who identify as Jews. It is an impossible mission, and this is the Jewish tragedy. Why do you say that? To start with, we have history. How is it possible that people all along the history, and this is something that they say, oh, we suffer, we suffer, we suffer, we suffer, we suffer. Why do you suffer? You suffer. Look in the mirror and ask yourself, why do I suffer? How is it possible that Bernard Lazar writes in, two in uh, 1902, before the Holocaust, as the most crucial question, how is it possible the Jews have been expelled from every city they lived in? He asked the question, what is wrong? And he comes with different answers, actually. He believed that it's chosenism, really. The supremacy. But they don't read him. They made him into an anti-Semite. I wrote a book. I told them, Everything they should know. They made me, uh, Dershowitz called me the biggest enemy of the Jewish people. I'm worse than Hitler. Which my mom actually said, mm, this is <laughs> <laughs> She never appreciated me. She always looked down at me. <laughs> Sandy said, ooh, yeah, you like the feeler. Yeah, this is good in the family. She said, oh, but my son is like Hitler. You know, <laughs> you know, all right? This is the Jewish tragedy. This is a Jewish tragedy. They cannot, they don't have the cultural means to self 
reflect. Am I right? I'm right. My right. father was the IDF. What do you expect? What yeah. Do you now, this is very interesting. Was he born in Israel? No, he, at a very young age, he migrated from Iran, mm. like 13. So. Okay. Because what is very interesting is that actually, when it comes to Israelis, they're slightly ahead of the diaspora Jews. It's a generalization. But when you look intellectually at the only people who really contributed to the understanding of this Jewish thing, you come up with Israel Shachak, who operated in Israel, Israel Shamir, who was born in Russia, but in Russia, but Shlomo Zand, myself, if you don't mind, Gideon Levy, Uri of Neri. These are all the only people who really try to tell us something meaningful. All the diaspora Jews, the JVP, the, 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 maybe Finkelstein, <coughs> Nick. All the rest are lying compulsively, intention, intentionally, and consciously. And why? Their job is to, to suppress the understanding. What is Jewish power? What is Jewish power? Jewish power is the power to stop us talking about Jewish power. This is what it is. Who is taking care of it? Dershowitz? No. Dershowitz is celebrating his power. Bibi Netanyahu? Are you crazy? Bibi Netanyahu, come to the Congress. You are sitting, standing, sitting. 27 times, standing ovation. <coughs> Man, he turned your fucking Congress into a gym. <laughs> and next time when Bibi comes, we will add we're standing up and uh, 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 yeah. you know? This will be amazing. Amazing. It's not Bibi, it's not Dershowitz, it's his Chomsky. It's Amy Goodman and a democracy later. <laughs> <laughs> it's Paul J and the real Jew, not real Jew, real news. It's the progressive networks and Jewish intellectuals that stop us from talking about Jewish power. When Mersheimer and Walt published a book, very important book, about the Jewish lobby, they called it the Israeli lobby because they were polite, but it's a Jewish lobby. <laughs> Amy Goodman didn't invite them to the studio to discuss the book. She invited Noam Chomsky to criticize the book. She was in the open participating in silencing the discussion on Jewish power. These people are unfortunately our enemies. We have to be aware of it. And I, they bring disaster on the Jews. I don't feel a difference. I, this is, I, I want to ask you this question. It's it's not not here. But you have a whole variety of forces that are cri critical of Israel, critical of the way the Palestinians are treated, you know, and, and, they, and they educate you and so forth. Yeah. How do you know the good from the bad? And it seems to me that, that, what, that when you criticize Mondo Weiss, which yeah. is educational to me, yeah. right? JVP and, and, and so forth, you're dumping on the people that give you, give you hope that something's going to change. <coughs> okay, it's very, very simple. It's very, very simple. And as far as I'm aware, we have one Palestinian in the room or more? Where is he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll make it very simple and I want, I, 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 because uh, this is not a discussion that is dedicated to Palestine, I'll try to make it as concise as I can. Very simple. When I started to look into the Palestinian issue, something that, uh, that happened to me around the time of 
around 82, when I was a soldier at the time of Lebanon War, the, the first. Now we are three, I think. <coughs> it was very clear to me. It is all about one thing. The right of return. The Palestinian people were ethnically cleansed. Many of them are still living in refugee camps in, oh, in the region, in horrendous conditions. <coughs> It is all about one point four billion dollar annual UN budget to take care of it. Yeah. At a certain stage, some Jews, whether they are good or bad, I don't know, realized that this is not right. And this is becoming a Jewish problem. And they decided to interfere and to do something. And this is what they did. The first thing that they did, number one, they taught us to speak about end the occupation. What is end the occupation? End the occupation is not right of return. End the occupation is the legitimization of the Jewish state. And some of us were stupid enough to follow it. The next thing that they started to talk about, I'm talking about Jewish solidarity, colonialism. What a bunch of bullshit. Israel is not colonialism. Colonialism is a relationship between a settler state, sorry, between a mother state and a settler state. <coughs> Israel is a settler state. Where is mommy? There is no mommy. It's not like Britain sending few troops to India. <coughs> No. It was bullshit. I stood up and said it's bullshit. So they invented another bullshit. Settler colonialism. Settler colonialism has nothing to do with the Jewish state. Settler colonialism is superpower A mobilizing ethnic minority B to a land C on the expense of population D. Like Britain sending Scots to Ireland on the expense of the Irish, and uh, Northern Ireland on the expense of the Irish people. Zionism? Chaim Weizmann mobilized Chaim Weizmann, uh, ethnic minority B, pushing <laughs> America. It's not A, B, C, D, it's B, A, C, D. It's not set up. Why do they come with, with colonialism? Why is it so important for them to make sure that we think about colonialism? Because then the Jews are not uniquely bad. They are just as bad as the Brits or the French or the Spanish or the Italians or the Americans. It is, it is a spin. In fact, Zionism is a unique phenomenon 2,000 years passed, and you go, oh my God, I was living here. When? 2,000 years ago. And they got away with it. <laughs> try to think of Brits, try to think of Italians coming to Piccadilly Circus, and they start to tell the Brits, you know, we have to move and start to dig. What the fuck are you doing? Hey. We've been here before. When? <coughs> we, we, we are the offshoots of the Romans. They get kicked <coughs> out and they, they throw them to jail. <laughs> the Zionists got away with it. Another bullshit. Apartheid. Is Israel apartheid? Yeah. No. <laughs> it's far worse. Way worse. Apartheid is a racist system <coughs> of exploitation. Israel doesn't want to exploit the Palestinians. It wants them out. It wants them, it wants them <coughs> ethnically cleansed, wiped out. Israel is a genocidal, racist, expansionist, nationalist country. 
They do slow genocide. We spoke with uh, Monier yesterday about the water, how they do it. It is an Hitlerian model. So we don't speak about Israel being Hitlerian because the Jews don't like it in Mondo Wise. So we start to talk about models that appeared in the history. So we said apartheid and then we have post apartheid. It is they have managed in the last 20 years since they got involved to suffocate the Palestinian solidarity discourse with a manifold of misleading notions and guess what? Nothing happened in this solidarity discourse. At the certain stage, in the 80s, in the 90s, <coughs> it looked as if we are moving somewhere. We know what we were talking about. Now we are left with intense misleading <coughs> discourse and I'll make it now, final statement. While in the 80s it was the right of return, in 2017 all we are left is, is with the right to BDS, the right to boycott divestment. <laughs> it's a joke. They destroyed Palestine, they destroyed the Palestinians, and all because they wanted to show that some Jews are good. I don't buy it. If a Jew is a good, he doesn't have to operate as a Jew. He operates as a great human being. Simple as that. Next. Sorry, say it again. What is the solution to the Arab Israeli conflict? Who said that there is a solution? <laughs> we like to think. I believe that there is no solution. Because for a solution, you need an acknowledgement. For the situation to resolve, the Jewish population would have to admit to themselves that they are living on someone else's land. <coughs> I realized at a certain stage, and I left and never came back. I'm sure that I'm not the only one. There's probably another person or two. <laughs> People who subscribe to chosenism, do not self-reflect, and far worse than that, people who subscribe to chosenism are not familiar enough with the notion of the other. There is an anger strike at the moment. 1500? Palestinian uh, prisoners are <coughs> striking. The Israeli soldiers are cooking steak and food right I'm going there. The exactly. Yeah. It's not Israeli soldiers even. It's a bunch of soldiers and civilians. Civilians are having barbecue parties in proximity to the concentration camp. Now, what kind of people engage in such an act? Exactly. I mean, I, 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 I punish you. No, no. No, he's right. He's right. People who are not empathic. People who aren't empathic are often psychopaths. We are dealing with a form of psychopath. Now, to try to address your question, I did say that. Peace won't prevail. I believe that it's, it is all about the facts on the ground. Israel is one state. Palestine, it's exactly the same state. They have one electric grid. They have one sewage system. I think that it's the same pre-dial area code. Very much. 
But this land is dominated currently by Jewish supremacist ideology. And this will change just because the facts on the ground will change. The Palestinian will become a majority. We think of around 2045, they predict. And by the way, the fact that they are majority doesn't mean that this will introduce a political change. The political change will happen. Now check out something amazing. In Israel, we can have election tomorrow. And theoretically, it is possible that an Arab political leader becomes the Prime Minister. This can happen in Israel. Not tomorrow, not in 10 years ago, not in 10 years, sorry, but it can happen. The third biggest party in Israel is an Arab party. Now, can you see Jewish Boys for Peace becoming an Arab party, Jewish voice for Jew, 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 Jew. <laughs> No, no, it will never happen. And here is the absurdity. The Jewish anti Zionists are more racially oriented than the Zionists who are supposed to be the ultimate racist. So, yes, I don't believe in any of those Jewish organizations, they are AZZ, anti-Zionist Zionist, like the AFF, anti-fascist fascists. It's always the same symptoms. Your question, it's not a solution, it's a fact. It's the facts on the ground. How, how does uh, Anna Balzer fit into this? Anna Balzer. Yeah. I don't know Anna Balzer personally, and I never spoke about it in public, but I'll do now. Four or five years ago, you know Anna Balzer? No. no. Lucky you. <laughs> no, no, she's a beautiful woman. But this is the only good thing I can say about her. <laughs> and I'm slightly personal here. Four or five years ago, I was invited to Boulder University to give a talk in Boulder University. The talk was supposed to start at half past six. At quarter to six, I was uh, at the home of the guy who put this event together. He had a telephone call. It was Anna Balser. Were you with us in the room then? But you know the story, I guess, no? Yeah. It was Anna Balzer. Anna Balzer told him, you cannot do it. Why? Because this, the, you called your event uh, Israeli Apartheid Week. It was Israeli Apartheid Week. And Israeli Apartheid Week is now copyright by the Jews. Yeah? And Gilad, and Gilad cannot do it. <laughs> this is Anna Balzer. This is Anna Balzer. This is JVP. This is Mondo Wise. These are all those people. If they really, if they want to subscribe to humanism, they better join humanity once and for all and operate with all of us. It's, it's always the same thing. Got a question here. Just one, just one more sentence. In this book, I make, it's more than one sentence, it's clear, I'm, I have to make it very clear. In this book, I made, I think, a very important distinction. Because we don't talk about Jews. I don't know the Jews. I talk about people who identify as Jews. Now, people who identify as Jews are divided into three categories. <coughs> Those who identify with Judaism, the Torah, you believe, oh, yeah, which is 
an innocent category. <coughs> By the way, these categories are not exclusive, mutually exclusive. Yeah? So the second category are people who identify as Jews because they have Jewish ancestry, which is also, you know, you have a Jewish grandmother, it doesn't make you into a <coughs> serial killer. <laughs> it's an innocent category. And the third, the third category are Jews who identify politically, politically as Jews, and they are never innocent. Never innocent. And why? Because if you identify politically with a racially oriented ideology, you are basically a racist. When Jews, all the time, we see it all the time, so, oh, he's a white supremacist, he's a racist, you know what they do? They project their symptoms. They attribute their own racism to people who happen to be white. People who happen to be white can be racist, but they're not necessarily racist. But when a Jew calls a white person racist, necessarily projecting Jewish symptom of racism. Next. You, uh, you, you, you didn't, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. You, you had, you had I the did answer. One before, but yeah, yeah, but look, okay. look, look at yourself <laughs> and look at there. What, do you think that you stand okay, a chance? She wins. <laughs> <laughs> and you see, this is to be Athenian, to tell the truth. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, so while I'd love to get more into Israel and Palestine, I actually want to ask you something more about the speech that you just gave right now. Nice. And I, yeah, I have a very specific question for you, which is you referenced several times, you know, this growing political correctness, this suppression of free speech occurring under everyone's noses, yeah. and Americans are so stupid because we haven't noticed. And I just want to say, you know, growing up, again, I, from what I can remember even in elementary school or middle school or high school, I think there is very open backlash in this country against PC police and all of these terms. And, you know, again, I've, I've heard my father talking about these things. And it, it's been discussed, maybe I'm, you know, a unique case, but I think it's been discussed very openly, both in books. I don't know if you're familiar with Bernard Goldberg, but he's written a lot. Bernard who? Goldberg, yeah. He's, guess what, he's a Jew. But he, he wrote a book called The 50 People That Are Ruining America. And he wrote this book. I think in like 2001, it was like pre 9-11 book and he was talking about political correctness there and that was a best-selling book. Yeah. So I'm saying you're, you're making all these references to people not being aware of what was going on, but I think the backlash has been very loud for a long time. I think that you're right and I'm very happy that you mentioned Mr. Goldberg and I will even take it one step farther, I'll mention Andrew Breitbart. Go ahead. No, I just need no. to, to write on something. Oh. Can I use sure, this? Of course. You sure? You sure? Go ahead, yeah. Okay. Yeah. If I get my question. Okay. Later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is great, man. <laughs> you know what? Take it back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Great question. Frightening answer. Are you brave enough? This is. Everybody can see it. No. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. This is this thing is a Jewish problem. <laughs> Okay? Jewish problem is when the Jews admit to themselves that everyone, that everyone around is pissed off, no, you don't say pissed off, is angry with them and want to throw them under the wheels of the bus. This can be Palestine, banking, central banking. Yeah. Big wars. Media. Media. Department of Homeland Security. <laughs> Education. Judicial system. Yeah. Media and political correctness. Pornography. Political. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. It's good. It's good. Ben, and you're all Jews. You know, you are the best Jews I've ever met. You know, these are good Jews. Good Jews are 
self haters. <laughs> <laughs> like, like Jesus, like Spinoza, like Otto Weininger, like Marx, like Gilad Atzmon, and these three Atzmons. And I never met them before. All right? Come on. Why? Wait, 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 wait. Ca capitalism. Never mind, never mind. Okay, when, when Jews, okay, so look what we have here. When Jews understand that something about them is totally problematic, they invent a Jewish satellite opposition. Are you one? Good question. Good question. Good question. If I forget, if I forget to answer, you remind me. Okay? It's a, it's the most important question. Yes. You think like a Jew. <laughs> By the way, I also think like a Jew. This is why I present this. Jewish problem, Jewish control, opposition. They start to fight. Yeah. So. If this is Palestine is a Jewish problem, we will have JVP and Mondo Wise. Solution. If banking is a problem, we will have we will have communist and Marxism. Right. If Wall Street is the problem, we will have Bernie Sanders. <laughs> yeah? Media. We will have Amy Democracy Amy Later. <laughs> she should say that. Yeah? <laughs> What? I cannot read my handwriting, it's, it's awful. Okay, okay, you understand the principle. What happens then? Now, it is not conspiratorial. These people, the control, the control opposition, the control opposition, the satellite opposition or whatever, is not conspiratorial. It is very natural for a Jew to see, I, I made a calculation today, by the way, it's very natural to 0.0066% of the Jews, <laughs> of the Jews, it's not 0.0066, no percent, of the Jews, which is something like, it's smaller than a foreskin, really, <laughs> to feel very embarrassed by the crime that, Israeli, that Israel commits in Palestine. It is very natural to to again, pro probably the same percentage, to feel embarrassed by the crime committed by Soros, Bernie Madoff, and so on and so on in Wall Street. Okay? So it's not necessarily conspiratorial, but then something fascinating is happening. Ah, sorry, this was PC. This is Goldberg and Andrew Breitbart. Something fascinating is happening. When the people around start to see that the Jews fight between, amongst themselves, they do something very interesting. They form a new theater, and they move out of the discourse, and they just sit around and let the Jews fighting themselves. Why? Because if they don't do that, we would have a Holocaust once a week. Can you imagine? Holocaust once a week, the gas, the trade. There won't be even time to do Holocaust denial. <laughs> All right? So what, what is happening, what is happening here is that every, and this is the answer for you about 9-11, every important issue in America is now an internal Jewish debate. <laughs> Neocon's war is Chomsky versus Aris. Political correctness is... Ben Shapiro. <laughs> no, 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 it, 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 uh, Breitbart, Goldberg, Shapiro versus the progressives, uh, blah, 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 which is kind of a, a, a Jewish collective. 9-11, 9-11 is not a Jewish problem. I did say that the Jews, did, it's not a Jewish problem. You know, I, I know. If 9-11 would be a Jewish problem, within two days, there will be Jews for truth, for 9-11 truth. 
And then, and then, within three days, they will take over with Moshe against Yosef. They will crazy, crazy. No, no, it's not there yet. I think that's happened, huh? Maybe, maybe I can see, I can see some of it happening, by the way. I don't want, I, I, for sure. Okay, this is the, if global warming is becoming a Jewish problem, there will be Jews for global warming. It's not. And by the way, this is a really a Jewish, I don't want to go there. All right? They did that, they did now, last child. Now, Andrew Breitbart, you want to talk about Goldberg. I want to talk about Andrew Breitbart, because I think that Andrew Breitbart and it's in the book, presented the most eloquent, succinct argument against political correctness. I read his book. I was astonished. I thought, did I write it? <laughs> <laughs> but then I noticed that in every talk, He speaks about his bar mitzvah. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> and even the story. At a certain stage, right-wing intellectuals in this country, people like Kevin McDonald, Pat Buchanan, really started to understand that there is an issue with political correctness. <clears throat> if you look at the, the South uh, Poverty Law Center, they were really starting to go, oh, they, 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 they blame us, the Jews, the Frankfurt School, and blah, 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 this is all in the book. <laughs> all right? The Frankfurt School, the Wilhelm Reich, they argued that we, the Jews, destroyed America. Andrew Breitbart came and presented an incredible argument. In fact, he was more successful in it than... McDonald, Buchanan, and quite a few others. But I smell the rat. I always smell the rat. <laughs> <laughs> Some people call me rent to kill. Do you have rent to kill in this country? Probably not. Anyway, no, it's a kind of, uh, uh, sorry, come ignore it. We'll take it out. Uh, <laughs> I started to look into Andrew Breitbart, and this is how Andrew Breitbart refers to the destructive impact of the cultural Marxists of the Frankfurt School, the William Reich, all those people that came here and introduced political correctness. This is what he says. He says, at a certain stage in the 30s, a bunch of German academics, there were no German academics, they were Marxist, post-Marxist Jews. <laughs> yeah? Yeah? They were post-Marxist Jews. They didn't even identify as Jews, but they were Jews. So why do you lie? German, at the second stage, it's almost very better. A bunch of German academics came to this country and interfered with what? with our Judeo-Christian values. Right. <laughs> yeah. Did you get it? Genius? Yeah. What a spin. This is how it works. This is the story. Control opposition, you are all out. You let Andrew Breitbart, that by the way is Breitbart.com, was established where? Jerusalem. Not in Athens, in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. <clears throat> all right? Now, you ask, if it, they ask, they, you are a Jew, and you ask, how do we know that, not. that, that I'm not? Control it's not your question. Everybody else should ask. You have to be extremely suspicious of everything I do, because I'm dangerous. <laughs> 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 All right? I just don't smell a rat at all. <laughs> Good. You have to ask yourself and to dig. And you know why? You know why? 
because I'm not an Israeli for 20 years and I'm not a Jew for 20 years and I even got my foreskin back. <laughs> and it all right? I have it here, it's, it's, it's so small, but it's kind of my karma, I take it. You can, it's very small. <laughs> <laughs> and it is, and I told you, it's not conspiratorial what they do with this control opposition. It is, may even be possible that I fall into this trap and I operate unconsciously as a control opposition. And if I do, you have to tell me, you have to tell me. So when some people kind of the anti semites say, hey, Gilad is a Jew, you know, I'm not offended by it. I understand where they come from. This is my process of de -judification. I accept that people are angry with me as well. It is fine. They should be. One last question. Okay, I have one. Okay. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> okay. What I'm going to do? What I'm going to do? I take kind of a round, blah blah blah, and I'll, I'll answer. Okay. You, my, so. my one is very have to be with the with the book. So how can we do as individuals fight this political correctness? What can we do as individuals? Great. Thinking at the same time that we don't want to lose each one of our friends. If, is there something that... Okay, good. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on circumcision. And yeah. um, <laughs> it's my guess it yeah. might go some way towards explaining the Jewish character. <laughs> okay. Next. Uh, Muslims are also circumcised. Uh, yeah. Saturday night you were talking about the one Jew in one town, how many synagogues does he need? Yeah. So what is the question? No, that, could you talk about that for a second? Okay. Uh, last one. Gilad, how do we resurrect Athens? Okay, this is the same. Who was? How do we yeah. resurrect okay. Athens? Okay. Sorry. Circumcision being a problem or as a significant impact is very possible. Something small to say about it. Jews were extremely irritated by the fact that in World War II, at the time of the so-called Shoah, Germans would see a man, and they suspected he's a Jew, and take the trousers on the train. What do you do if you are a Jew? If I were a Jew, I would make sure that I don't circumcise my son. But I'm not a proper Jew. What they did? They circumcised all of you. <laughs> Can you imagine? And you, oh, you and you, uh, God, it, chop it. Out. Are you out of your fucking mind to let it happen? You're cute. Because your will is out. <laughs> How many synagogues you need in a village with one Jew? Two. One to go to, one to boycott. This is JVP. <laughs> and the most important question, what do we do? First, we get our foreskin back. Because at the time, at the moment, it's not just the foreskin, you are literally castrated. Intellectually, mentally, ideologically. And what do we do once we got our foreskin back? You don't have to be worried because you hey! <laughs> what do you do then? You learn 
to call a spade a spade. This is the art of Athens. What is the most important thing in Athens, and I hope that I'm pronouncing it right. I asked the other day a Greek professor, Aletheia. Truth. Truth. You were a nation of truth seekers. Nation of people who were excited about your ability to be free. What are the fucking two best things that happen in this country? Your freedom and jazz. <laughs> Look out, listen to your jazz music. It's fucking boring like shit. Where's the spirit of Coltrane, of Miles? What is left out of it? You made it into white bourgeoisie music in schools like Berkeley and Schmerkley and Dirkley. <laughs> the black music is not black anymore. You turn it into an academic ex exercise. Freedom. America was the land of the free. You're not even free to say what you think. You came to this country because it was the land of the free. It's the land of the freaks. <laughs> <laughs> and this can be changed when you make a decision. You are here today. I, 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 I didn't meet most of you. I know some people here. But you are here because I'm not dead. Because I speak my mind. I'm an Archie Bunker. I'm what Donald Trump claims to be. <clears throat> is he controlled opposition too? Sorry? Is Donald Trump It's beyond question now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I like, I like the fact that Trump won. I love it. You know why? Not because I agree with him. Because Trump helped us to understand that there is opposition. We were living in this idiotic progressive as a universe, as a, as a, as a, as a. And suddenly, somebody comes and says, I want to make America great again. And say, wow, Trump is the one who proved to us that the real utopia is nostalgia. This is a fascinating observation. Now, I know that people speak about Trump and say that he's illiterate, blah, blah, blah. He can be a lot of things. But he's also a genius in a very unconventional sense. He's a very, very unique human being. If he would be slightly less of a narcissist, it, be, it would be less dangerous. Because this means really need love. Oh, I love you, love you, love you. What can I do today with you to love you? Oh, maybe I'm bomb Syria. Yeah! And they, they, they do. And they do love him immediately. <laughs> it's quite astonishing. <coughs> anyway, I'm very happy that Trump was elected. It was a wake-up call. Who are the only people who don't understand this wake-up call? The progressives. They should live in Egypt. They're living in denial. <laughs> <laughs> Completely. Still, they don't understand what happened. And I'm very happy that Trump delivers nothing. And you know why? Because the situation is now galvanized. He was voted to do America first. Within three months, it is clear that once again it's Israel first. <laughs> and people are truly, genuinely upset. And when people upset are upset with Jerusalem, this is where Athens reinstate itself as, as the spirit 
of the good. That's it. play maybe um, something short and then we go to eat something. <laughs> Let me just say that uh, we're, we're lucky that you all came here. We're lucky we even had this place here. And Laszlo was responsible for making that possible. So Indeed. And another thing, um, as I told you, I really operate with completely, uh, you know, independently, and uh, it is Rashid, actually, who uh, offered his help, and believe it or not, he sent an email to every person who has an access to a microphone in this part of the world, and not, not one of them was happy to... Uh, to give me an access to wide public, which is not a problem. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> because truth, when truth, I, I don't claim to know the truth, but I'm aimed at it. When truth is shared between people, you know as much. I, I, I didn't give you a single fact today. In my work, there are no facts. You are the facts. I'm the fact. I'm the fact. No, the fact. All right? This is the most important thing. Rashid, thank you for everything you did, man. It was impressive. Yeah. There's one more thing. And that That's is, it. Rashid wants to say something. There's a great LA audience. KPFK, shut us down, continuously. KPFK, Pacifica, denied us continuously in the past six months. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And this is this is far from being uh, this is far from being surprised. I used to walk in with it's K, K, KPFK. It's, it's kind of all over the country. Am I right? Yeah. 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 And I must admit that in the early days they always welcomed me. And once I said what I had to say, they were very very quick to drop me because. They are just, as some of you realize, control opposition. These people who were pushing this country allegedly towards <laughs> more tolerance and better future were lying, and this is where we are, where we are now. Let's music and forget about everything. Well, there's one, one more thing, I do love, yeah. and this is very important. There's very few of you that we actually know how to reach. And when Yila comes back to Los Angeles, we'd like to be able to reach you. In order for that to happen, you'd have to put your name and your email address on a piece of paper that's out there on the desk in yes. front. So, it's a real way. May I say something? Thank you for uh, the Hungarian Culture of Alliance. Absolutely. And I hope, I hope that you will be happy to take us again. Yeah. Sure. Right. All right. <laughs> Let's play. Music. <laughs>